Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Bea, and today I will be talking to Benjamin List. Benjamin List is an organic chemist at my institute, the Max Planck Institute for Kornforschung, and his main work focuses on the field of organocatalysis. Ben List received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry this year, 2021, and so today we will be talking to a Nobel Prize winner. We will be talking to him about his research, why he won the Nobel Prize, and in general his opinions on what kind of research will be important in the future and how our work as chemists will change. It is an honor to have him on our podcast today, and so let's get started. Hi, Ben. Um, First of all, a huge congratulations for winning the Nobel Prize. Uh, You've probably heard so many people congratulate you, but it's it's such a huge achievement. So really, congratulations. And second of all, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast with us. I know you're really busy, so I really do appreciate you being here. I'm very happy to be here. Um, So first of all, maybe just introduce yourself to the audience. Um, Mm -hmm. Tell us what you do. Yeah, my name is Ben List. Uh, I'm a chemist and... We are working with catalysts and the special type of catalysts we use are organic molecules. And that was something unusual actually 20 years ago. (laughs) So what are catalysts? Well, catalysts, um, I I have this new sentence I like to say. It's something I invented, I think. Catalysts are just one molecule away from magic. Because if you think about it, you have a certain material and then you use your magic stick and it's converted into something else, like a bouquet of flowers into a rabbit, for example. A catalyst can accomplish something like this and this one single molecule then does what is called turn over and it turns over one material into the other one and and in that sense it's almost magic. That's why I'm in love with catalysis. But what's beautiful about catalysis is also that it is a technology and I would argue something I realized recently, the single most important technology that humans have. Yeah, I guess mm-hmm. catalysis is everywhere. Just a lot of people don't know yes. what it actually means. Exactly. So I think that, that's a really nice explanation. I do mm-hmm. like it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you mentioned organocatalysis. Yes. So what is the organo? Well, part organo. Of it? So previously, like let's say 20 years ago, chemists, or a little bit more than 20 years ago, chemists were con- convinced that in order to have selective and general catalysts, you need either a metal or you need an enzyme, a biological catalyst, like the catalyst in our own bodies that help us digesting and whatever we we do with our bodies. All the the biological functions are mediated by catalysts. And organo means small organic molecules made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, essentially. These are the organic molecules. Simple molecules like proline and amino acid, something we can also make with our body, but with which, which people thought were not competent as catalysts. And so you've already kind of mentioned that you won the Nobel Prize for the field of organocatalysis. So mm-hmm. maybe you can expand a bit on that. Why, why did you win the Nobel Prize? Well, so first, I think there's, there's two aspects here. One is the, the, that organic molecules as catalysts had been overlooked before and, and people were just not aware. So it's like the third class of catalysts. Mm-hmm. That's one aspect. But the other aspect, and that's equally important, is technologically they're also useful. For example, they're very, very helpful in making these chiral pharmaceutically active molecules where you have you know, single-handed sort of mirror image-like molecules and we can selectively make them with organocatalysis. Uh, amongst the, the technical application, there is one process to make an antiviral, uh, which is very successfully used in, in HIV. I don't know if you knew this, you're pretty young, but in the 80s, yeah. this was yeah. the worst pandemic of all times on this planet. And ha- like, I don't know, hundreds, but several million people, dozens of millions mm-hmm. of people died from it. And now it's actually a, not curable, but treatable disease. And, and people take three or four small molecule drugs, and one of them is made using uh, asymmetric organocatalysis. 
So your technology or um, organic catalysis is used a lot in the pharmaceutical industries? Yes, it's used a lot, both in MedChem, when they mm. design small molecule drugs, but also in processes. Okay, so the scale up also of yes. so ma making these organic catalysts mm -hmm. on a really large scale yes. is is fine. There's yes. also methods to Absolutely do that. Absolutely fine. Exactly. There was no uh, problem for the industry to take over these technologies. Of course, it's easy and it's simple. Yeah. Think about proline, my favorite catalyst, and for which I've not now received the Nobel Prize. Proline is a non-toxic edible molecule, in fact. Sometimes in my talks, I ate a little bit of proline just to show it's an edible catalyst, right? I mean, that's fascinating. In principle, catalysts are inherently green because you need such a small amount, right? And normally they don't end up in the environment because you recycle them. So there's in, in principle no problem, but of course it is even better to have a non-toxic compound that's water soluble and that's cheap and so on. And that's why I think these, these technologies are also important and useful in industry. Yeah, so I mean, something that I definitely want to be um, asking you about, maybe we can go into more detail on it later, is kind of this comparison with organocatalysts. And as you mentioned, a lot of the times um, we used to use, or we still use, transition metal catalysts. Yes, exactly. So metal catalysts and kind yeah. of like the, the, the real difference between them. Yeah. So, because you were mentioning how organocatalysts, um, they're green for the environment. So how do they compare to transition metal catalysts? I also said that transition metal catalysts equally are, are green for the environment because as catalysts, all ca mm -hmm. types of catalysts are, are inherently energy saving, uh, resource saving because you know don't need reagents and they're recyclable and so on. And I, I would also never say anything negative about transition metal catalysts. They're awesome. They can do things we would never, probably never be able to do with organic molecules. Organic molecules are not here to replace them, at least in most of the cases. Consider, for example, the, the catalysts in our cars, right? Yeah. These are platinum and palladium, mm -hmm. and they're solid catalysts. So it's like on the other end of the spectrum of catalysis, and they work at very high temperatures. Organic catalysts would probably burn under these conditions. Mm. So you really need them there. And similarly, for example, for hydrogenation, which is probably the, the single most important um, technique for asymmetric synthesis on an industrial scale, you also typically, not always, but almost always need metal-based catalysts. Yeah. So they have their role. And I would say these techniques, techniques are complementary. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you don't, you feel like they're two completely different fields and they can't really be compared to each other. Well, there is, of course, always the comparison, like how about um, turnover numbers, mm. catalyst loadings, efficiency rates, costs, and so on. These all, this, in, this, in this sense, you can compare them. In terms of reactivity, there is a small overlap, you know, certain reactions that you can catalyze both with transition metal and organic molecules. And in this case, I would say typically the organic catalysts win, but then there's a huge area where you just cannot um, compare them because it's completely different reactivity. Consider, for example, cross-coupling, yeah. for which there was a Nobel Prize in 2010 or 11. Yeah, yeah. And also uh, olefin metathesis. Yeah. These are things that organic molecules so far cannot do. I would not say it will never be possible, but it would be very unusual and very, very tricky. Mm. So why do you think that organocatalysts right now cannot do those transformations yet? Is it because maybe you haven't focused or the scientific community hasn't focused mm. on trying to use organocatalysts for no, that? There is one very important distinction and and i think people are not so aware of it and, it, and now we go a little bit into details of chemistry i it's hope you know, your listeners are okay it's with fine, it yeah. and that's if you think about the periodic tables the table the organic elements are in sort of the top rows mm -hmm. and the 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 electronics of these elements is such that you have well, you have the so-called S and P orbitals available. But if you go lower in, in the, the periodic table, you end up with the transition metals and they have additional orbitals for, that can engage in reactions with substrates. And these are D orbitals. And D orbitals have a unique kind of symmetry and reactivity that, that differentiates them uh, mm -hmm. from, from organic molecules. And that enables this amazing reactivity like olefin metathesis and cross-coupling. And that's yeah. currently, with current organic molecules, pretty much impossible. Yeah. yeah. So going back to the whole story of you winning the Nobel Prize, mm -hmm. I still wanted to ask how was this discovery made and what stage in your career did you yeah. actually make this discovery? Yeah, I, I really like to think back of these days. And it was a beautiful week in, in June in 1999. 
And the story before that was that I was a total synthesis chemist. I was trained as a total synthesis or hardcore organic chemist in, in a laboratory of Johann Mulze, my, my awesome PhD supervisor. And I wanted to change fields and I wanted to learn how enzymes work. Mm. And so I moved to Scripps and, and there Richard Lerner was working with catalytic antibodies. So that was something unusual and now it's actually kind of a sleeping field. Yeah. But they tried to train antibodies to become enzymes. I was that was sort That's of really the cool. program. It was, it's, I, I felt That's the really same cool. thing. Yeah. I, I loved it, and and I I was so lucky that the antibody that I was so fortunate to work with an aldolase antibody, an, an antibody that catalyzes aldol reactions, um, was very efficient, highly selective, and and also yeah, I, I could use it. I could use it even on scale, on, on a preparative scale. What organic chemists really like to do, mm. and. Um, so one of my tasks as a postdoc then was to really look into the details, how does that antibody does it, its catalysis. And we, we were so fortunate to have an X-ray structure of this, of this protein. It's a very big molecule, 96 uh, kilo Dalton. They're huge molecules. Yeah. And we got an antibody, a crystal structure. The resolution was not great, but I could see in the active site of this antibody one amino group a lysine mm -hmm. residue, and also a tyro tyrosine phenol group bound to a water molecule. So now it's get getting very specific. But in, in a nutshell, the two functional groups in this antibody were an amino group and an acid. Yeah. Amino huh. acid. And then I, I, I begin, began to realize this is also how natural aldolase enzymes, even in our own body work, they have an amino group and an acid group. And this then sort of made click in my mind and I thought, why not just, you don't need a metal for this, A and B, why not just designing small molecules that have an amino group and an acid group and catalyze the same reaction, right? And of course, you know, being a synthetic chemist trained in Johann Mulzer's laboratory, I knew there was already in the late 60s an example where people had used proline without, I have to say, really understanding why it did the, the job that it did at the time. And for me, then everything sort of made sense. Ah, proline is just a small aldolase. That's how it does mm -hmm. it. It has an acid group, it has an amino group. So let's try proline. And, and then I remember this experiment in, in June 1999. I, I set it up. This was my first independent experiment and it was 100% designed in terms of the catalytic cycle. So it was really a design, one of the few experiments that I designed and that really worked. Yeah. And my very first independent experiment, and it worked. That's so, I, so know, crazy. Yeah, I, I wish was, that would happen to more people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's a very nice story. It was, yeah. it was crazy, but, but I, 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 did, I took a TLC, you know what this yeah. is, like the first analytical tool that chemists use. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's comparable to like a, cell, a COVID self-test. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's a little bit like a COVID self-test. <laughs> and it, it, it turned out to be positive in that sense, really yeah. positive. It showed me I, I got the product and I was super excited. And I could foresee you know, what I mean, in parts at least, not yeah. the explosion that happened later with organic catalysis. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like also mm -hmm. knowing, did you expect it to become so important? And mm -hmm. also, did you expect to win the Nobel Prize for such a technology? No, I didn't. I mean, certainly not then, you know, but, but I, I could see the potential, mm. you know. It worked. It worked like any other catalyst. Very efficiently overnight. I got just the product. It looked really clean. I got even high selectivity already yeah. in this very first experiment. So I, I could clearly, I could foresee what, at least I thought, okay, my career, kind of my, my I will get tenured and I will get a job. You know, these are questions you ask yeah. yourself when you, when you start out, right? Yeah. And I saw all that and I saw that there were several other reactions that you can catalyze and, and so on. So that was, for me, it was super exciting. Yeah, what's so fascinating is that, you know, also at a young age, mm -hmm. I mean, I, you were probably a lot older than me, but because um, I just started out with my PhD, mm -hmm. but it's sometimes really hard when you're young to know what are the big fields and what are the fields that yeah. really will have a huge impact because I feel like that also comes with experience. Yes. Now you probably have a much better understanding of what fields are going to be the next yeah. big ones. It's true, but it's also such that, you know, this was not a field at the time. Yeah. Right? If you think about it. Yeah. Nobody, I thought literally nobody on the planet was working on it. Yeah. So I, I, I would also like to encourage your, your listeners to 
take this under consideration, not trying to see what is the next big field on which I should jump and also be a player, but how about creating your own field? Of course, not everybody can do it and sometimes yeah. maybe you don't have this great vision at this moment, but it's still something I would encourage you to, to try to think about. Create your own stuff, you know, and there's, there's always new people coming up with their own fields, right? Yeah. Even at this institute, yeah. I mean, we have these young group leaders, they come here and then they just do something else. And I think it's awesome, not necessarily organocatalysis or metaphysis. They just do their own own things and, and create their own field. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah, sometimes in chemistry, a lot of things were discovered back in the 1950s, 1960s. You just mm -hmm. have to dig into that literature and, it's also and then take idea. it from there and develop it further yes. as well. Yes. So I feel like a lot of chemistry yeah. is there, has yes. been explored a tiny bit, but just hasn't been further developed. Yes, yeah. exactly. And then you develop it and you take a different look at it and you call it in a certain way and then people think yeah why didn't i think about this yeah. this way right so often it's just a different way how you think about something that can create can lead to a new field yeah and, yeah and so um then you made this discovery with pro using proline mm -hmm. and then you were the first person to publish a paper on what now is known as organocatalysis i wouldn't say that because of yeah. course if you if you and we cited those people also over the last century there was maybe there were a few pioneers that had already shown organic molecules to be competent catalysts it's that's actually why it's even more surprising that this discovery um, came so late so what macmillan and i really somehow did was to understand that this is something general and it's something definable with the mechanism that you can describe and it's not something weird and exotic that people somehow didn't really take under considerations right like, like mm. before there were organic catalytic reactions in, in already over the century there were a few examples and i have many reviews where where i cite cite those papers right but to see this like like transition matter catalysis where you have these fundamental activation modes pi coordination, oxidative addition, you know, mm. all this is all like common knowledge, right? Yeah. But you have the same things in organocatalysis, yeah. right? You have Branstad acid activation, Branstad base catalysis, you have Lewis acid activation, Lewis base catalysis, cabine reactivity, Breslau intermediates. There's so many fundamental organocatalytic steps. It's as rich or maybe even richer than transition metal catalysis. Mm. And yeah. And um, so the first paper that you published, was it fairly high impact or? Yeah, yeah. yeah it was yeah. So, so people so I, knew this was gonna be a big yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, I think so, I think so. It was, every, I mean, I got emails, I got letters from really big people. Yeah. In the field. My first independent paper, where wow. I was the corresponding author. I got nice letters, this is until today, it hardly ever happens. So if you plan an academic career, yeah. don't rely your happiness on receiving recognition <laughs> from your colleagues because it's really rare. You know? <laughs> But I got, I mean, I got, a, I got a few letters from really heroes of mine and I think people were like rubbing their eyes in disbelief. Wow, this is possible, unbelievable. And then a couple of months later, Macmillan's paper came out yeah. kind of in the same uh, mechanistic manifold, like the aminium ion formation is the key step in, in his catalysis. Yeah. And then this was like, that was that emphasized this even more and he also coined the term organocatalysis right and and then i think that that this this ignited really the field yeah and these two papers coming out simultaneously showing actually this is something understandable definable designable and so on and, and yeah yeah, yeah. so just quickly for the audience um Macmillan is the person that you won the Nobel Prize with, so you're yeah. sharing the Nobel Prize, and he's yes. a researcher yeah. um, in America at Princeton. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so, um, but you guys were not working together at all. Like, you made no. these discoveries yeah. completely, yeah. completely independently. Completely independently, and, uh, you know, that was actually kind of nice also for me to see in the beginning. I mean, I, the feeling I had, and it's hard to explain when I, when I started my independent career, betting on, on this re reaction, right? On, on yeah. using organic molecules as catalysts, that this, I was a bit insecure, right? I mm. thought maybe it's a naive idea, maybe others have already tried and know, all the good chemists already know it's not gonna work. Right? Yeah. This was kind of the sense I had. And um, then seeing that somebody else using it for a different reaction, a Diels-Alder reaction, one of the most important reactions organic chemists have developed, 
Uh, I think it was nice. It was a bit frightening because I felt, oops, there's competition from a very good lab, a very aggressive lab in, in Northern California. But yeah. It was also uh, pleasant at the same time. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of organocatalysis, do you feel like this is a field that's going to grow in the future and that there's still a lot left to develop? Or we've kind of reached those key transformations that it's going to be really good at and it's going yeah. to take an extra effort to try to find new reactivity mm -hmm. with it? I think it's kind of a mix of both. Uh, on the one hand, what we have seen is this exponential growth. I mean, in this year 2000, there were maybe five papers in organocatalysis, I think two from my, from my group and maybe three or two also from Macmillan's group in mm. this one year, right? Now, yeah. there's not a single day where there are not at least five to 10 papers on organocatalysis. A single, like every day, right? Yeah. So it has grown like exponentially, but now the exponential growth is not there anymore. Mm. So if you, you, you see these curves, it's like typical for all research fields. Yeah. They have an exponential growth yeah, yeah. and then you reach kind of a steady state phase. Also, actually, the numbers of, of, of where people or the, the numbers of papers that cite organocatalysis is getting less. But I would argue this is also because it, there's no need to, to use the term anymore. Right? We're now much more precise in calling the type of catalysis we do. Mm. You work maybe with transition metals, yeah. but you wouldn't have in, your, in the title of your paper transition metal catalyzed fluorination reaction, right? No. You have the nickel or palladium or whatever metal you're using. And the same is happening in organocatalysis also. So I think it's not, it's not uh, really slowing down much. I think it's just stable on a very, very high level. There's not a single department on the globe or a single pharmaceutical company not using organocatalysis right yeah. now. So it's, but then, then the question is, then, but on the other hand, I also think that there's still um, new activation modes being developed. So there's still awesomely creative, you know, new people coming up and maybe they get the advice, don't go in, into organocatalysis, it's kind of a ripe field and it has reached its, its, its maximum. And, but then they have a new idea and yeah. things are different. So I would, I would strongly advise to never listen to such advice. Yeah, yeah. so you think it's still slower, but it's still going to keep growing. Yes, I think it's still there, there's still potential for, for huge yeah. innovations. And what about you on a personal level? Like mm -hmm. you've been working on organocatalysis mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. a, your whole career. Do you, yeah. Are you going to keep working on it or do I you think, think it's time to maybe switch? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I, I love this area and this prize comes at a time when we really, I think this was, this has been the best phase of, of this laboratory since its inauguration in 1999. Okay. We have catalysts now that are the single, the, the most reactive enantioselective catalysts that have ever been made, that people have ever used, sub PPM. So this means less than one part per million mm. of the catalyst loading. This is, I saw it on your yeah, posters outside. So, yeah, so, and I, I'm proud of this because I remember the early days they said, yeah, you have this protein catalyst, 25 mole percent. I mean, yeah. this is ridiculous. I wouldn't even call this a catalyst. You know, People would make fun of this, which yeah. is silly because it's, it's a technically used catalyst or substoichiometric reagent, as people have called it, which mm -hmm. is, I mean, it's kind of silly because what's the catalyst police and who enforces like to say this is a catalyst and this is a substoichiometric reagent? Yeah. But in any case, now I'm happy to see actually organocatalysts define the state of the art in homogeneous in antiselective catalysis, right? And we start activating olefins right now. This is something that's happening. We had a, had a science paper a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, what's the next goal then if you can protonate olefins? How about protonating alkanes? So there is so much exciting stuff that we can do and that yeah. we still want to do that I sometimes hope the, this, this prize doesn't really, you know, remove me entirely from the lab. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's always interesting. Sometimes maybe you want to, you know, take the knowledge that you have gained in this lab and go start on a new field. Mm -hmm. Then it's also really hard because you have so much knowledge. It's also so true. Yeah. It's sometimes, you know, you're the expert in the field, so it's really hard to switch somewhere else. Yeah, you have kind of this... Yeah, once you're like in the groove and then also the, the students come here, they yeah. come here to do asymmetric organocatalysis yeah. and then I tell them, please work with uh, solids or work with enzymes. It's sometimes, sometimes difficult. Yeah. But I would also say that, you know, I, I'm freer than I have been even before, right? As a Max Planck director, you know the system, like mm -hmm. we get this automatic funding, automatic funding, we don't have to really apply. We have to justify what we do a few, every th few years, but we, overall, we're pretty free in, in our research topics. Yeah. Um, so, 
but with the Nobel Prize, of course, I'm, I'm even beyond that freedom, right? I can do whatever I want. And I sometimes have this thinking that what, as a chemist, what can we do to make this world a better place? And what is the biggest challenge right now humans face? And I would argue it's global warming and it's happening, right? So what would be, what would be a contribution that chemists could make to this? And I think energy conversion is an important issue and we're happy to have this institute here on campus and, and they're working on these problems. And I sometimes imagine like working with CO2 and somehow taking it out of the atmosphere, converting it into something useful like gasoline, for mm. example, then people could still run their, use their cars because it's kind of neutral with the, with the climate. But I'm also fantasizing about chemical reactions, like it's the simplest chemical reaction you've probably ever heard of, but somehow you don't find it in any textbook. CO2, catalysts and mm. light to C plus O2. Yeah. That's my dream. Yeah. Right? So we would fix this problem, right? We take out mm. CO2 from the atmosphere, we make coal or, or diamonds or, yeah. or graphene and oxygen. Right? Imagine this would be such a game changer. And and I think it's I love basic research, that's why I'm here, and why I'm in the Max Planck Society, but why not using our our knowledge, our creativity, our understanding of chemistry to help, you know, you know, so tackle big problems that we're facing right now. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's nice. Sometimes when you stay in a field and you become an expert, then you can do bigger things with it. Yeah. Kind of like, and I think it's also important for academics to have the bigger picture in mind. Yeah. Kind of like your idea. So yeah. good luck with that. Let me know. I'll keep an eye out on the yeah. literature if you yes. ever develop yeah. it. So what are some um, other problems or unresolved challenges in organocatalysis? Um, I mean, one, as I said, I mean, for me, one of the holy grails right now is olefin activation, precisely because that's the traditional domain of these d-orbital uh, containing transition metal elements, mm -hmm. right? Palladium loves to bind oh, to yeah. and platinum and nickel. It's like so natural. But I would argue there's another very natural reactivity that organocatalysts can provide, and that's just protonating an olefin. Okay, yeah. Right? And, and you generate a carbocation in this protonation, and the carbocation can engage in very useful transformations. Imagine, for example, if we were able to hydrate a terminal olefin to give it a secondary alcohol, such processes, I think, could be immensely valuable. It's kind of this, we call this early stage organocatalysis, yeah. right? To differentiate from late stage chemistry, which I love, which is fascinating. Tobias Ritter is one of my heroes in this area. Um, but early stage is also important, right? It's, it's like a different thinking then. It's not like the, to make different drugs or, or, or make different variants of biologically active molecules so much as it is sort of the upgrading of cheap materials, sense, you know, scent chemists, chemist yeah. chemicals like, you know, propylene or one octene or benzene or toluene and make extremely valuable material mm. in an early stage, right? And not after five steps of refinements, right? So that's kind of what, what I think that organocatalysis could evolve to. Yeah. 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 So um, I wanted to talk also more about the field of transition metal catalysis and organocatalysis um, so yeah I guess you've kind of said they can't you can't really compare them so much do you see one of the fields growing more than the other I think to be honest right now it seems like transition metal catalysis is, is, is yeah. growing again much stronger there was a time yeah. when when everybody moved to organocatalysis yeah right and that was uh, you know the I don't know maybe 10 or 15 years ago 15 years ago maybe when when people spoke of the gold rush of organic catalysis. Now everybody moves into the other direction mm. again. I'm totally fine with it. And uh, there's also so much transition metal can offer, transition metals can offer. So yeah, I think it's, there are always these waves. If you're a little bit longer in the field, I'm kind of mid-career now, you can see these waves, right? Sometimes yeah. it's transition metals, sometimes it's biocatalysis, sometimes it's organocatalysis. I see a great future also for biocatalysis. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I think, so. yeah, this, with these techniques of, of uh, directed evolution and and then people now begin to do artificial non-natural uh, enzymeology so to mm. say right i mean that's amazing imagine like like an enzyme that does olefin metathesis i think that would be cool that'd be really cool uh, yeah and it's also scalable there are now more and more industrial applications so yeah you never know and and, and i would never say you know everybody has to do organocatalysis you know 
You should do what you somehow feel like doing and certainly not what you think is going to be the next trend, right? Do what, mm. you, what you like to do. It's the best. If you're enthusiastic about your work, it's going to be good. Yeah. And if not, at least you were enthusiastic doing it, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> it's sometimes easier to work on something, though, where that you really think is going to be yeah. the next big wave. Exactly. So, yeah. like, because you're also, you have so much experience here in mid-career, can you predict what the next fields are going to be or is that just something that no one can really do i would i would argue it's probably something no one can really do and you should be really careful and people have tried it in the past it usually doesn't work yeah you know, like when you say like i expect only novel things to arise from transition metals and enzymes in 1990 yeah. in the 1990s it looks silly now in retrospect. Right? Yeah. And people have done that. <laughs> so yeah. I don't wanna I don't want to take the risk of also people citing me later, well Ben List predicted this and that and, and and then I was so wrong. I will probably be wrong if I would predict something. But I think it's actually I love basic research and do something exotic, work with uranium salts, for example. Mm -hmm. Why not, right? So use the F elements, the F orbitals. Yeah. So, yeah. Why not? I mean, maybe they can do something that D orbitals cannot do. Yeah. And design something, you know, really specific for, for those elements. Um, that's something I would find fascinating. I mean, people are already doing this a little bit, but, you know, that would be something I find, find interesting. Um... Yeah, so also, um, I didn't want to interrupt you, no, 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 but no. I, I actually am um, on to this topic of predicting the future. So can you maybe now already kind of predict what kind of fields in organic chemistry yeah. have the potential in the next 20 years to win the Nobel Prize? Yeah, I mean, one thing I really like is, of course, the, the mRNA delivery, like yeah. the, the vaccination, the, what, what is now sort of used in, in these beautiful COVID-19 vaccines. I mean, this is such an amazing discovery. They could win a medical medicine prize, but also a chemistry prize. I think, you know, I saw commentaries in the news, people saying they should have won the Nobel Prize. But I think, you know, <laughs> of course, I'm, I'm close to this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not, to be honest, I had the same view. I thought they, they, they could have won it this year. But the Nobel Pr Prize, the committee, they do a really, really careful job in the evaluation. And it takes some time for them, and I think rightfully so. You don't want to want to give a Nobel Prize, and then one year later it turns out I don't know it causes I don't know whatever side effects. Yes, yeah, what that's the risk with the mRNA vaccines, yeah, because they haven't been used mm -hmm. so much. I mean, now everyone's vaccinated with COVID, so they've been yeah. used a lot, but yeah. only for against one virus. So yeah. I feel like with the Nobel Prize, it's like you have to wait and actually see yeah. where yeah, exactly. how useful the technology is. But yeah. you believe that mRNA technology will think, be seeing yes. a lot of that in the future. Yes, I think. I mean, if if everything is as good as it seems right now. They definitely would deserve a Nobel Prize, and then, then there's this uh, this one person, um, Kaolin Kariko. Mm. I, I, I'm not sure if I got the first name right, but she has this beautiful story also to tell. Like in the '90s, she worked with this concept, you know, using modified RNA, and and um, as to, also for vaccination, right? But people didn't believe her story. You know, nobody would give her funding. She didn't get tenure. All these, you know, sad stories, and, and there's even more incredible, uh, incredible things about her life. And now, all of a sudden, you know, this is the technology that saves the planet right now. Yeah. I mean, how amazing that must be, right? And yeah. if this is all true, and I, I, I think I would agree with the Nobel people to, you know, wait a little bit, maybe one or two more years to be absolutely safe. But I think she deserves one. Yeah. But I'm also not a biologist, so there might be other people's be people before her. Mm. But I think this is a great field. What I wanted to say in terms of predicting what would be important is, as I said, by, uh, in basic research, do whatever you love, what, somehow what your heart tells you to do. That's my advice. But I see, of course, right now, global warming. Can we contribute something to this? So I know this is applied science in a way, and, and, but I think, as I said, you know, I, I, I see that there will be a lot of funding and a lot of great discoveries also at some point come out of this funding. So I, I can only encourage the young people to try helping with this, solving this problem. Because yeah. catalysis will be needed. There's no doubt about it. Catalysis. I mean, it's already needed now. Exactly. Yeah, so exactly. much is yeah. done with catalysis. Catalysis yeah. is so important. Yeah, I find it a shame that because chemistry is just so hard to explain to the general yeah. public. Yeah. 
I feel like not so many have a good knowledge or understanding of where chemistry is actually used, such as catalysis. Yes. But I wanted to talk about science communication as well, maybe mm-hmm. at the end of this podcast or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was still um, interested in maybe knowing if there were other fields in organic chemistry that you think could have mm-hmm. won the Nobel Prize now with you or maybe in 20 <laughs> years down mm-hmm. the line. Yeah, let's see. I'm not sure. I mean, well, I mean, one thing, not a specific thing, but one thing I wanted to say to this is I see people saying, you know, finally another chemistry prize and and it's not going to the biologist or the Mm. medical people. And I don't necessarily agree to this completely because I, for example, mRNA, this technology, this is chemistry. Right, they make these. Mm. They they make the the uh, the bases chemically, right? And the mRNA is made from a DNA that is made by chemical yeah. synthesis, right? There is so much chemistry in this. These are molecules, and I think it's it's totally okay for for uh, giving the Nobel Prize to also more biology uh, oriented uh, discoveries. Yeah. Um, in terms of pure chemistry. Yeah, I don't know. It's, right it's now, hard. You caught me on the wrong foot. I, I, I haven't yeah. really thought about this right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you, um, like, I don't know if you guys talk, like, you know, who else was maybe shortlisted this year for the Nobel Prize? Well, you, you, see, you see what I see on Twitter. Just on, yeah. yeah. I was kind of happy to see an organocatalysis was not mentioned at all. Yeah. But it's kind of nice because the, the Twitter community was as surprised as we were you yeah. know, that it came this year, right? Yeah. But, and, but it makes it even more beautiful, I have to say. Yeah. Kind of everything is predictable, you know, it will get boring, right? I mean, within the chemistry community, I think mm-hmm. a lot of people knew that at some point you were going to get the Nobel Prize. Did you expect it so early? Because no, you're no, still really young. Yeah, and so. I, I guess I said I kind of feel mid-career, and, but you're right, I, I would never have expected it in this year. I mean, we had a TV team in 2009 already here because they oh. read on a, oh. on a website that would predict the next Nobel Prize winner based on citations. And yeah. at the time, I was, I think, the best cited European chemist and among the organic chemists on the planet. I was also number one or two wow. in that year. So, so they, they, they used this citation uh, behavior to predict this year Ben List will win it. And some TV stations thought, okay, that, that's the prediction. Let's go to yeah. Mülheim. And they went here. I was in Switzerland at the time, actually, yeah. because I, I didn't believe it. And so, yeah, it didn't, didn't come out of completely uh, thin air, you know. It was still, still. I, I would have never expected. Also, this year yeah. to receive it. You know, maybe when I'm seventy or eighty. But yeah. Yeah, um, and so I wanted to also talk to you maybe about some more futuristic things mm-hmm. in chemistry because you clearly have a really great mind. So it'd be mm-hmm. nice to hear your opinions. Yeah, go so, ahead. what kind of fields in chemistry do you think will grow in the future? Mm, um, how about CO two conversion? CO two conversion. Yeah, I think CO two conversion is is a formidable problem. I've mentioned this already now yeah. a few times. I'm, this is, for me, one of the, the cool things I, I would like to, to be involved with. And, and the reaction I proposed to you, CO2 to CNO2 is just one. But if you think about it, the beauty of this reaction, it's so much deeper because, you know, this is what plants do. It's called mm. photosynthesis. Right? <laughs> plants, with their green leaves, what they do is they take CO2 from air, react it with water, to give carbohydrates, CH2O, and oxygen. So the stuff that we like to eat and the stuff that we like to breathe in. I mean, it's kind of the greatest yeah. gift for humans on this planet. It's photosynthesis, right? And so what we do as humans is often we just go to the other direction, right? We burn everything. <laughs> we yeah. burn it and produce CO2 and water, right? Yeah. So I, I, I love this idea that we now also, with this understanding develop uh, chemistry that goes into the reverse direction again, using sunlight to convert CO2 into something useful. Mm -hmm. And and this was just one example, but you could also, for example, consider Fischer-Tropsch, right? You know this, it was discovered at this institute, Mm -hmm. and I think in the early... uh, Maybe you can tell the audience also what it is. Yeah, Fischer-Tropsch was, it's actually interesting, this is why this institute is called Kohlenforschung, Coal Research, Institute for Coal Research, because that was its origin. We started out with this idea, can we utilize coal 
to convert it into gasoline, into fuel, because Germany at the time didn't have good access to oil. And, and at the time, oil was also not so readily available on the planet like it is today. And so the idea was, can we use coal to make gasoline? And for this, indeed, they were successful. Fischer and his, I think, PhD student and later group leader, Tropsch, together developed this process in which they react coal with water, so C plus H2O, to synthesis gas, and that is H2 plus CO, hydrogen gas and carbon monoxide. That's synthesis gas. And so that process was known, it's called coal hydration, kind of. Now you can use this synthesis gas and in the presence of heterogeneous catalysts, metals, ruthenium, cobalt, iron, and so on, you can convert this indeed into alkanes, including you know, smaller molecule alkanes that you can use as, as fuel material. So that's Fischer drop. But of course, it is now a process that's derived from fossil materials and ultimately the fuel is being mm. burned. So you, what, what's happening on a global perspective is converting coal into CO2, right? And that's, of course, as we know now, not the right direction. But is it possible now to take CO2 out of air, out of the air, and react it with water, CO2 plus H2O, to synthesis gas and oxygen? Mm. That would also be, you see all the atoms yeah, come yeah. into place, CO, H2, and O2, mm. right? That would be kind of a, a chemical version of photosynthesis. Yeah. Considering also, I sometimes view synthesis gas, this mixture of CO and hydrogen, as the equivalent of, of, a, of a, a carbohydrate, right? It's kind of the same energy level, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think that would be a sweet process, right? You, you, I imagine like plants where, you know, the CO2 comes in and some water and out comes synthesis gas and oxygen. And from the synthesis gas, as you know, all organic chemistry can be made. Alkanes, but later then also olefins and arenes and mm. so on. And, so one day when all the, in theory, all the, the, the fossil material is gone in the distant future, fortunately, we can, the organic chemistry can still exist because we will be able to make fitter drops from CO2 and water. Yeah. Right. And, and then, then it's also climate neutral because overall, you know, everything, we, what we take out of the atmosphere, we bring, bring back, back into the atmosphere. So there they wouldn't be even any problem in burning yeah. fuel anymore. Right. So it's yeah. kind of a, uh, an interesting... Uh, and you think organocatalysis can do this? <laughs> sure. Catalyzed absolutely. by organocatalysts? Absolutely. Why not? <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's one of those fields that has not been developed yet. Not yet. So exactly. not yet. Yeah. Right, and, and we should be visionary, right? If I say, you know, the next big thing is photoredox, I think it it's, sounds a bit lame because it's already a big thing. And yeah. Everybody's doing it and it is super exciting and it's already solving big problems. So we should be a little bit more imaginative. Here. Do you do any, um, do you use any light in your lab right now? Well, occasionally we do and I, I have absolutely no problem. I, I mean, I, what I say to my students is like, you know, photoredox is super exciting and if you have a reaction that will either change the world or is absolutely revolutionary and solves a problem, be my guest and do it. Yeah. But yet another amino trifluoromethylation or, or decarboxylative nickel co-catalyzed okay. cross-cutting, sorry, I mean, we're not going to do this. Yeah. You know, let's 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 invent our own fields, right? Rather than being yeah. very, very, very late on, on an exciting field that's already ongoing. Yeah, exactly. You always want to be the first one, like ideally, you were. <laughs> ideally, right? Yeah. And we have the resources and, and you know everything that it takes here. So I think that's our duty, our job, you know. Yeah. yeah. And so how do you think chemistry is going to change in the future? Mm. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's similarly hard to hard to predict. Um, chemistry is really uh, an enabling science, and I'm not sure if it necessarily has to fundamentally change. Right? There's there's this one message that I like to always tell people that I have, and that's why I do all these interviews, also with TV shows and talk shows and so on. Right now, is that this discrepancy between the perception of chemistry mm. and its relevance for human life on this planet is probably the biggest one 
that exists on the planet, right? It's like so amazing how people mm. view chemistry. We're polluting the world. We produce plastic. Oh, it's the worst thing ever. Yeah. Just, yeah. In the ocean and we do glyphosate and it's probably toxic and cancerogenic and causes yeah. depressions and, and, and birth defects and so on. That on, is on the one side. And on the other hand, then you see um, the, the great gifts that come out of chemistry that make our lives so comfortable and so healthy and so beautiful, right? We, we, don't, we don't freeze in my office. We have enough to eat. We have great medicines. We can, we can fly across the planet. All these are achievements from, from chemistry and especially from catalysis. And it's, it's I think, a good message for, for people to tell, to, do, to, to, to hear that actually chemistry is something that's good for us. Right? And it's not from somebody who is, you know, influenced by industry or whatever. It's my, my you know, personal experience and that I yeah. like to share. But how do you convince people that chemistry is yeah. needed, essential, yeah. it's good, it's, there's nothing bad. I mean, there's always something bad that you can yes. find about everything, though. Yes, exactly. But how do you convince people that it's so good, I think important? We, don't, we shouldn't try to convince people, but we should just share our joy and excitement and, and, and the beauty and... and just mention also the, don't try to convince, but mention the, the gifts that mm. chemistry provides for us. Yeah. Right? What I said about, about the pandemic HIV, it was the worst pandemic of all times. And these patients now, they're still HIV patients, of course, in, in the, let's say, richer countries at least, they all live a normal life. I mean, it saves lives, literally, you know, mm. to millions of lives. And that's what chemistry does, right? And, but people have, a, have a, know, the, the wrong perception. It's, it's a yeah. hard topic also. It's a hard, hard thing to explain. Sometimes I'm in talk shows and I try to explain what I'm, what I'm doing and then I'm being interrupted before I even get to explaining it because they ah, don't talk about these molecules. It's so complicated. There is this, ah, it's the, I don't know the right word for it. Um, it feels like something foreign, right? Chemistry. Yeah. And, and people... It feels unnatural. It's very abstract. It's, it's very, very abstract. I mean, you, you mentioned orbitals. Like, what yes. are orbitals? Exactly. I mean, orbitals are, it's a concept that's yes. very, even for chemists, it's yes. very hard to understand. I couldn't agree more. And so like how can, yeah, it's how like, can a non-chemist do it? <laughs> yeah, but yeah. that's what I struggle with because I, I really enjoy talking about chemistry. I enjoy mm -hmm. talking about science. Though, and so mm -hmm. I do podcasts. And I always find myself doing more podcasts in non-chemistry related mm -hmm. topics, like more biology or more physics. Yeah. Chemistry is, it's so, so hard, hard to have a podcast I know, on. I know. It's, so it's, how, yeah, how can we change that? Mm -hmm. I think one of the main problems is that mm -hmm. chemistry, when, when we speak chemistry, it's an own language. Yeah. There's just so much vocabulary that yeah. is unknown. Yeah. And I feel like in, chem, in biology and physics, maybe you can simplify it a bit easier. Perhaps, yeah, perhaps. Although when it gets deep in, in physics, I think yeah, I mean, you yeah. lose your, your, your listeners. Yeah. <laughs> similar in biology as well. I mean, like just talking yeah. about the immune system or the brain, right? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's like beyond. Yeah. And, and quantum mechanics is the same. But I think we, what we, the beauty of chemistry is that it is a creative science. We create new things. And mm -hmm. this is something we can always mention to people. Like we make these molecules. Yeah. Somebody has to make the molecules. It's like what I like to say, right? It, it, you know, it, it's not like machine learning and, 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 and digital chemistry that will solve the problems. At some point, the, the material has to be made, actually. You need yeah. the molecules, right? You need them to, to treat patients. You need them to feed uh, uh, people. And, and, and you need them... To, to heat the, the rooms, right, and to drive the cars. So there are many, many beautiful gifts that, that chemistry provides. I think I, I like to focus on that aspect. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I was, I was once trying to explain my research to my 13-year-old sister, mm -hmm. which, um, which was very hard to do. Yeah. And I think what was so hard is I was like, well, I need to make a molecule. So let's take ibuprofen. You know what ibuprofen is. Mm -hmm. it, this is the chemical structure of it. And she's like, what? Yeah. Like, it, yeah. it's so hard. It's, yeah, even that. Or it's, when you say yeah. we need to, we're making molecules, mm -hmm. people don't realize what a molecule is. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But, um, yeah, well, you've done so many talk shows and interviews now. Mm -hmm. So do you find like it's getting easier to explain chemistry? And what are some kind of you know, ways that you can teach me or other people in science communication? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a good question, but I, I think it's, it's a question you should ask yourself because you have this podcast. It's your job. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm glad yeah. it's not my job. It's hard. Yeah. It, is, it is hard. But I also like to do it. I, I go to the schools, for example, and 
I like to speak to kindergarten kids and, and talk, tell them about the beauty of chemistry and the excitement. I want to get them excited like I was when I was a kid. And yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think what's hard about chemistry sometimes, um, it's like, it's not, people cannot relate so well to chemistry. It's maybe yeah. a lot easier yeah. to relate to yeah. um, physics and biology. And so maybe Probably. you need to find mm -hmm. something that yeah. they can relate to yes. and then it yeah. becomes easier to talk yeah. about. And we know it's kind of the nerds that go into chemistry traditionally. Yeah. Right? And yeah, it's, it's, it's a really special science. And as you said, and, and it's sort of the, the, the dark secret of chemistry is its rules are not understand, understood and they're not understandable. Nobody understands no. it. Nobody understands, I think, quantum mechanics. Yeah. I, think it, I think it's impossible to understand. Yeah, of course, it the, is. you can deal with the math. And this is kind of what we chemists have have uh, relaxed upon that we can we can deal with the math with Schrodinger equation. Yeah. Okay, I understand that, and I can try to find solutions to it. But but to really understand that matter is made of it can you can be equally described as matter and and a wave like light. It's kind of non understandable. Like one thing cannot be two things at the same time, right? Yeah. It's yeah. it's impossible to grasp with our minds, and and that's the truth. And so. That's also the beauty of chemistry because it, it leaves this space for creativity and playing around a little bit and in intuition, which mm. I find important. Yeah. And so how do you think our job as a chemist mm -hmm. is, how do you think my job is going to change in the next 50 years? In okay. terms of maybe how much AI is going to impact yeah. Yeah, chemistry. That's a, good, that's a good point. I mean, artificial intelligence and machine learning, we are also embracing these technologies. And, and we just had a nice conference organized here where Derek Lowe, you probably mm -hmm. also know him, he, he spoke and, and he made this interesting analogy. I mean, I'm thinking about, imagine now we will have computer predicting chemical reactions and then robots performing them. Yeah. Then we're out of the business, right? In a way. At yeah. Some point. It's like, and then he just said, yeah, it was the same with, with laundries, right? There were people actually washing the laundries with the laundry yeah. with the hands, and then the laundry machines came, and that was the end of it. Yeah. And this is happening all the time, right? Machines replacing jobs, and perhaps this will at one point, at one day, happening to chemists. I mean, I to be honest, I don't see this coming soon, because I, I don't know. I mean, it, it might come maybe in twenty, and thirty, or fifty years, but maybe not. Who knows? Right? Yeah. It's, because chemistry is a bit harder than chess or, or go. But I also may be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think the simple jobs will be replaced. And mm -hmm. I think that will actually could happen pretty quickly. I, mm -hmm. I mean, now in the labs, we also see a column chromatography. Yes. I mean, in industry, you don't run a column anymore. No. It's all done um, by, by an automated machine. Yes. So maybe with those simple jobs, we'll see more robots doing that, but it's the creativity in chemistry. Yeah, and that, I don't know if a robot can learn that yes. or not. Same here. I mean, they have these artificial intelligence programs to design synthetic schemes, yeah. like multi-step sequences, and, and they're very excited about it. I don't know. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I know E.J. Corey has tried this in the, in the 60s, I think, already. Mm. At the time, maybe the, the computer power was not sufficient. Now, uh, it, it might come, and, and there are very promising people, promising research uh, efforts out there. Yeah. But it's definitely not yet a solved problem. Fortunately for me, I, I think for my career, I'm, I can Probably still, for my career as well, probably, I think. I think so too. It's going to come it's eventually. Yeah. And what I'm excited about is that, yeah, a lot of people are always scared. We're not going to have a job anymore. Mm -hmm. They're going to do everything for us. But I feel like they're going to open up also new job opportunities. It's exactly. just very hard to predict them. It's yes. kind of like the industrial revolution. Yeah. Everyone thought like, we're not going to have a job anymore, but yes. yeah. in the end, look what happened. I'm so happy to hear you saying this and, and because I have the exact same opinion and I'm ready, like, okay, I cannot do chemistry anymore because there are robots and machines that do a better job. Mm -hmm. So then I do something else. Yeah. Right? It, it, this freedom when the machines, t I'm, I'm optimist inherently, like if the machines take over all the, the dirty jobs, you know, we are free. We can we can do art. Yeah. We can we can do beautiful things. We can do music, or, or just hike the mountains and enjoy life. I mean, in, in principle, right? Why not? You know? Yeah. And if you if you're bored and you want to do something creative, you know, you can still find something that you can do. Yeah. 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 I mean, especially in the lab, I think in the robots or AI is very needed because I think two the two most important things about chemistry are reproducibility and efficiency yes that's what you get if you incorporate ai into your lab yes. 
Yes. Yeah. And I think yeah. with that, we'll see a lot of progress with it. Yeah. yeah. Well, then, on that note, thank you so much again for your time. It was a really interesting conversation. Yes. I really hope everyone enjoyed it. And uh, Thank you so much. I yeah. definitely enjoyed it. it was yeah, fun. for thank me as so well. Much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So that's it. Thank you all so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed this podcast with Nobel Prize laureate Benjamin List. If you like our podcasts, make sure to follow us on our Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram page. And make sure to follow Benjamin List on Twitter to stay up to date with his research. Thanks again for listening. Bye. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net Science Communication Group, known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Srinath Rankumar, and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy, bye!